and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. In these weekly video casts, we go over the latest and most interesting research that has come out in the past week or so on SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, paying special attention to those with an interest to data scientists and bioinformaticists. And this is for fans everywhere, if you're an expert in these fields or not. We want to create a snapshot of what's going on, what we think is really hot right now, and not do a comprehensive review of all the literature. There's a lot happening. There'll be links provided in the descriptions and comments um, to get you for further reading. This week, we're going, to be talk about, we're going to be talking about that Santa Clara study that came out trying to estimate the prevalence of um, COVID-19 in that population using a serological test. We're going to be talking about CRISPR, finally makes its debut, it was inevitable, and we're going to be talking about a really cool large-scale genomics analysis that was population-wide. Okay, let's jump right into that Santa Clara study. COVID-19 antibody seroprevalence in Santa Clara County, California. Ben David et al. Preprint put online April 14th, 2020. The goal of this preprint study was to use a serological blood test to measure the rate of SARS-CoV-2 infection in Santa Clara County. They tested a representative sample of Santa Clara County residents for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 using a lateral flow immunoassay. What they found was that the population prevalence of COVID-19 ranged from 2.5 to 4.1, 4.2%, and that these estimates were much greater than what was uh, being reported or confirmed as cases, 50 to 80 fold times greater. Now, my conclusions from this study are to, let's talk about it for a second. So this is a figure from the study that only had really a couple of figures and a lot of tables. And what you can see here is Santa Clara County broken up by zip code and the sample count. Uh, and what jumps out at you is that Stanford, um, the zip code that represents Stanford is really highly represented. And a lot of the other zip codes, especially where there are high populations are not represented. So that's interesting right there. There's a lot of interesting methodological details. And when it was posted online as a preprint, there are in fact 306 comments posted many of which were really well thought out, very critical of the study and the way it was approached. So the study does have some flaws. Um, whenever a statistical study has some flaws, I turn to one man, Andrew Gelman. He's a professor at Columbia University, um, and he has helped me think through a lot of problems, and reading his blog is always informative and educational. And he happened to write a very lengthy and thorough blog post on this paper. If you are not familiar with his blog, you should definitely check it out. There's a link provided below, and we'll put it in the, in the description. So the first thing that Andrew did was he asked if it passed the sniff test. Do the main reported results seem reasonable? And this is something that most of the really good statisticians like to start with. Uh, what they did, he said, basically, it kind of passes the sniff test, except it seems like it might be a little high in terms of estimates. He thinks that, you know, if this is true, then 5.4 million residents of New York City um, would have been exposed, and he doesn't know if that's really likely. Although we have heard estimates that are around that. So sniff test, okay. Uh, the next thing he does is he starts to dive in and break down the methods. So the first thing is uh, that they are not complete in the way they report the methods. So he notes that while they adjusted for zip code, and they don't really say exactly how they adjusted for zip code, although the authors responded in a comment, um, they perform no age adjustment, despite there being significant differences in the county and um, in their study. And most importantly, and this is where most um, important critiques are at, there are, um, there are inconsistencies in the way that the sensitivity or the false discovery rate is reported. And the ranges reported mean that the study could essentially have found almost nothing or completely consistent with current rates of infection um, or something like actually that they reported, which was very high rates of infection. And without knowing more about the way that it was done and without um, nailing down what these false discovery rates are in a, um, in a more accurate way, we will basically never know. He goes into a couple other points. The data aren't available. He says, even in a scrub form, you might be able to make the data available, um, but they're not. <coughs> and that there are selection biases, but these studies always have selection biases. And as long as you're open and honest about that selection procedure and you report that, then it's normally okay. The conclusion is that this kind of wasted a lot of people's time. And he's a little bit um, dramatic in the way that he concludes this, asking for an apology. I think it's probably not quite that bad, considering it is a preprint. 
Now, I want to point out that preprints are meant for criticism. It is the modern day equivalent of sharing with your colleagues and friends at your university to get feedback on your study, except now it's open to the world, and that makes it kind of a unique situation. But this is the intention of a preprint, to get good critical feedback. Probably you don't want to put a media machine behind it and promote that research until it's been peer reviewed. Um, so that is a little bit of an issue, but this is really what they are designed for. And I think in terms of that, it's been successful. I'd also like to point you to a New York Times article that was recently out talking about this issue, a really good read. All right, CRISPR has arrived. In the first study we're gonna talk about with CRISPR, development of CRISPR as an antiviral strategy to combat SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. The goal is, can CRISPR be used as an antiviral strategy? People have been thinking about using CRISPR as a therapeutic, and this is an extension of that work. So vaccines prime the immune system to respond and attack, but this approach would actually be a therapeutic that goes into your cells and digests the virus directly. They developed this uh, system um, they call Pac-Man, which does exactly that, uses CRISPR um, Cas13D in this case to go into the cells and digest that R those RNA sequences. And it's a really cool idea. This is really new novel therapeutic work. This is decades away from being useful, but there's gonna be a lot of interesting um, research that comes out because of it. This is just a description of their methods. I'll point out here, um, this is the viral uh, life cycle. And here is where their CRISPR technique kind of attacks the virus in these different phases of the life cycle. And you can see it's attacking the positive strain of the RNA. Second CRISPR study. CRISPR-Cas12 based detection of SARS-CoV-2. Now this one's a little closer to being useful now. The goal here is can we use CRISPR as a faster way to do testing for the virus? They use um, reverse, they use basic laboratory techniques in CRISPR-Cas12 um, to detect viral RNA. They found that it was faster than the way that we're doing it right now, 45 minutes versus four hours, but it's not as sensitive. So there's good progress, but I don't know if the sacrifice and sensitivity is really worth the time that you gain, but it's still an interesting study. So let's look at this. So here they're saying you can use a, um, a nasal swab, you can do extracts of the RNA, you can use the CRISPR uh, molecule to attach to that. Then you can attach this fluorescent protein, this molecule that can report on whether or not those have been found. This is what it looks like and a table of the comparison results, the way that we're doing this now using reverse transcriptase and PCR. And you can see that um, it's not quite as sensitive. The level of detection, um, limit of detection rather, is 10 copies per microliter versus one copy per microliter, or maybe up to three copies per microliter, um, but that the speed is much greater. And this is what that test might look like. All right, now a really cool study that just came out in New England Journal and from some researchers and companies in Iceland. Spread of SARS-CoV-2 in the Icelandic population. This is by Good. Jartson et al. and published in the New England Journal on April 14th, 2020. So this plan here was to study on a population level how SARS was entering and spreading through a population. They screened 6% of Iceland's population in two groups, a high-risk group and a general population group with an open call for random, in, with it, random invitations. Um, you can only do this type of really big capture on populations like those where are highly technical, have really good skills, um, and relatively small populations like Iceland. So it's a really cool study and unique in that way. So they found that 13% uh, of the high-risk groups and were infected, and less than 1% of the general population was infected. They also found that these results remain consistent across the course of the study, which took place over a month or so and that kids under 10 and women were less likely to test positive, reaffirming some of the things that we've known, um, and that they came from many different sources from around the globe, and I'll show you a really cool figure about that. So this is, a, this is the variant distribution that they found in their sequencing analysis, and you can see what really jumped out at me here was that there are some of the proteins, some of the, um, some of the genes for the virus are pretty tolerant to lots of mutations, like the N gene. Um, but there is much less variation in other parts of the genome. The, the S gene, the gene that codes for S, the gene that codes um, the, the gene in this region, also has some regions that are very low, ha, intolerant to variation. So those could be interesting because those could point to new therapeutics, maybe that's where we target therapeutics, or maybe those are the active parts of proteins. Those need to be investigated further. But a really cool representation of that. 
Um, and then they showed this plot, which was nice. This is a phylogeny, essentially, of the viral sequences that they um, collected in their study. And you can see they're colored by where they came from. So red, uh, the or origin is from Asia. Uh, yellow, the origin is from the Americas. And the blues and greens are all from different areas of Europe. And you can see the vast majority are coming from Europe, as expected, very um, relatively few from a subset of, uh, in Asia, and then some from the Americas as well. And um, you can see their sampling data and the date range, so around a month of sampling time. I want to highlight a really interesting project called CrowdFight COVID-19, where you can sign up, um, you can be a volunteer, and you can offer your services. Or if you're a researcher working with samples, working with patients, or working on data sets, and you have questions that you need help on, you can solicit for volunteers there too. Uh, I encourage you to check that out. And like I referenced before, we will have links to further reading in the description, uh, including scientific news articles, shout out for studies that we weren't able to get to that are really cool that we still love, and a list of ongoing projects and volunteering opportunities. And remember to subscribe to the channel so you always get a heads up on what's coming out. Thank you for your time today, and I'd like to say thanks, Scott, my executive producer, and all of you. See you next week.